So if it gets too hot in here, since this is a lecture on transport, we will practice transport and I'll go outside and continue the lecture there. Uh, so uh, to remind you, uh, this is the last section of what I wanted to talk about uh, for fermions and optical lattices. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about is not just the equilibrium states like insulator uh, states or, or something that's in the ground state, but what happens when you uh, ask how things move around, how particles get from point A to point B, and, and that goes under the general name of transport. So the reason that's uh, a, a commonly asked question is something I've already explained to you, that uh, a common signature of materials comes from looking at what uh, happens when you attach a voltage and measure a current or, uh, or do that in, in, in a transverse direction. You put a voltage here, you see what current goes there, this, this kind of stuff. And, and this transport type of measurement is nice because you don't have to have a theory already for what's there. It's a kind of signature that uh, doesn't presuppose a state or a wave function. And that has been studied in many different contexts, uh, probably by some of you here already. Uh, and, and some of the uh, most recent measurements uh, are also transported in the lattice. So uh, uh, what's, what's happening is uh, in some groups, they look under a lattice and they imprint a pattern, and then they watch the pattern kind of melt away. And that's a kind of measure of diffusive transport. Um, in, in a different group at MIT, uh, they look at a spin imbalance set up in a lattice, and then they again watch that order kind of melt away. Uh, also a measurement of diffusion, but spin diffusion. So those are all transport type of measurements. And what I'm going to ask about here is, is uh, something that will be a direct measurement of conductivity. And it's essentially, uh, I want to look at the response divided by the force put onto the material. And the response, I if it's a current, is what we call the conductivity. So um, it took about a millennium of physics before uh, our everyday experience of motion requiring effort uh, led uh, was displaced by a microscopic understanding that motion is the normal state of things and it takes force only to change the velocity, not to change your position. But the reason it takes a millennium of physics to do that, and, and also, by the way, a few months uh, of, of physics courses, if you're an undergraduate or a high schooler learning <laughs> about F equals MA intuition, which is not natural because it's kind of not what we feel in the world around us. Uh, on the other hand, if you open the system, if you couple yourself to environments, then those environments establish a natural rest frame. And so uh, you, if you go from a system where there's really Galilean invariance, that physics is the same uh, even in moving reference frames, and you go back to our world where we are coupled to our environment, or s a material is electrons are coupled to a, a material around it, then there is a, a preferred uh, velocity, which is often zero or at rest compared to your environment, and getting there involves dissipation. So uh, let's try it. Uh, what happens if uh, I take the lattices that uh, we've been talking about here and uh, you heard about last week, and I apply a force? <coughs> what happens? Well, if I take a weak external force and uh, I apply that to a block wave, a particle that's in, a, in an eigenstate of quasi-momentum, what happens is it, it, the quasi-momentum moves, uh, starts to change. Okay. So uh, you know, you apply some force or some amount of time, and the amount of time you apply that times time is how much your quasi-momentum changes. But uh, now what, what happens? Of course, this band structure is periodic. So if you keep going, then you come back to where you start. Okay? And that full cycle is called one block oscillation. Okay? The frequency of those block oscillations is proportional to the force and otherwise just given to you by the lattice constant and fundamental h bar. Okay. So that wasn't f equals ma. Uh, it, was, it was a little stranger than that. Um, and now we can construct uh, a wave packet dynamics for, for some kind of delocalized wave packet, which is fairly localized in Q. You can define a velocity, uh, which goes like, uh, for any Q, the local derivative in the dispersion relation. That's the group velocity of a wave packet. 
Uh, now, if I accelerate it in the way I've just told you, uh, that's the change of this group velocity versus time. And uh, if you apply the chain rule to this, this is the force divided by the effective mass, where now the effective mass must be the second derivative of the dispersion relation. And so I've already drawn this for you. If I have a cosine thing, then I have a dispersion relation. Uh, you know, you take one derivative, and this is the local group velocity. And you take another derivative, and this is one over the effective mass. Okay. So here's an ob observation of that uh, at uh, ENS in 1996, and there, what was measured is a cesium beam going through a standing wave that was fairly near resonance, but uh, not dissipative. And, and then what, what's looked at is uh, the velocity of the outgoing uh, wave. Okay, it's a relative velocity. Actually, they, they move the standing wave around. That's the cheating thing they did. But, but at, at various different depths of that standing wave, then looking at what the velocity did versus time, you see indeed it did this block oscillation. So applying a force to uh, a particle in a lattice doesn't cause it to continue to accelerate. It causes it to, to do some kind of oscillation. And in a deep enough lattice, this oscillation looks like a cosine or a sine, kind of like you expect it to. All right. So it's a little bit non-intuitive. You apply a force, things start to accelerate, and then they appear here again. But I've already told you about a natural interpretation of that uh, going over the, the hump of the of the dispersion relation is doing what? What kind of light matter interaction is that? Yeah. Did you hear the whisper? Bragg scattering. Right. So so basically what happens is you, you accelerate this de Broglie wave until its de Broglie wavelength matches the lattice, and then it reflects, it Bragg scatters. And so it can't go faster here because it just boink bounces off the, the grating that you set up to trap it. Okay. All right. By the way, this is something that's been discussed, of course, in condensed matter books for a long time. Uh, uh, but 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 the period in uh, in even superconductor uh, uh, sorry sorry super lattices so longer than natural period materials is like 600 femtoseconds, and that's really tough. But it's never been observed in a natural crystal because the frequency of oscillation is just too fast and the crystal is too dissipative. So the lesson this tells you is that once I have a lattice, then I've already broken Galilean invariance. V equals zero is special. You see, when I tried to go too far away from V equals zero, the lattice pulled me back and centered the dynamics around V equals zero. There's no longer Galilean invariance. I can't just boost all my velocities by some arbitrary amount and get all the same physics back. But this is non-dissipative. So just because I have a lattice around, some kind of reference frame, does not mean I necessarily have dissipation. Why do we have? Yeah. The block oscillation can be in the static frame. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned too many of the experimental tricks used in this observation. Think about a block oscillation at a fixed crystal, and I have at first a Q equals zero wave, and then its, it's quasi-momentum accelerates, uh, and then appears on the other side of the band structure and comes back to zero and keeps going. You don't, it is accelerated by an excel external force, but I can have that whole discussion in uh, the rest frame of the lattice. And that's what defines V equals zero here, the rest frame of the lattice. Other question? Okay, so why do we actually have dissipation in a material? It's because materials look like this, or at least this is my um, atomic physicist cartoon of a material, okay? Um, and, and so what, what does it have? Well, there's a lattice, but then there's like a, a lattice dislocation here and another lattice, which starts there. There's, there's impurity stuff sitting around, uh, and then you're, you're heating up this material, so it's vibrating, so there, there are little quanta vibrations, phonons zipping around. And so then these electrons, they can scatter off the phonons, they can scatter off the impurity, they get to the edge of one lattice, and they kind of do something funny going to the other one. And all of these play a role in actual resistance. Okay. So a, a big role is, of course, impurities and phonons, and, 
And the resistivity of a material when you take it to lower and lower temperatures and you get rid of phonons uh, is still a measure of how much impurities and dislocations and uh, things like that you have in your lattice. So now let's go and look instead of electrons at atoms in an optical lattice. Um, you don't have the impurities anymore. You don't have the phonons. You don't have the lattice dislocations. At least you can get rid of basically all of them. And so the only thing left that could cause resistivity is particle scattering, particles bumping into each other. That's a really different regime than most metals, where uh, it's all that other stuff which causes it. Okay, And so the kind of experiment we do when we're looking at resistance in an optical lattice is kind of like uh, resistance in a perfect crystal, and it's also a rigid crystal. So it's a perfect and infinitely hard crystal that has no phonons. And so now you can ask this question again about why there is resistivity. Of course, I'm describing this situation as atypical for materials. But on the other hand, for the, for the favorite model of condensed matter theorists, the Hubbard model, there's none of that. There's no phonons. There's no dislocations. There's no impurities. And so when we realize the Hubbard model with an optical lattice, then we're actually placing ourselves in exactly this regime where those things are gone. And now we might uh, again ask this question about how things move around and how dissipation occurs. Okay, questions about that kind of introduction to transport in lattices? Make sense? All right, so now let me start telling you about an experimental technique that uh, was proposed by these people and, and some of these people, and you can implement uh, in your lab too, and, and we did in our lab. So the idea is that you have a lattice and it's sitting in, in some kind of trap. And that trap is created either by cross dipole beams or by just the profile of the lattice beams themselves. But now if you can shake just that profile and not move around the lattice, you can displace this profile back and forth, then if that's the equivalent, if you just think about parabola plus slope, a displaced parabola is just like a parabola plus a slope plus an unimportant offset. So if I shake one direction, I'm going one direction, you get this, the other direction it's that. It's like applying an electric field. Shaking a lattice is like applying an electric field to it. And if we do that in a time-dependent way, we create a, a time-dependent force that we can tune by tuning how much uh, we displace that harmonic trap, and we can change the frequency by choosing how quickly we shake it. Okay. And so now this is some kind of force uh, that looks like this. And uh, uh, we're going to apply that and see what happens. Now, um, I can think about this force in a gauge field type way. If you have a force that looks like this, you can ask yourself, well, what is the time dependent gauge field that produces that force? And so think about how um, force is related to A. Okay, it's minus time dependent of A. And so you have I omega times some kind of gauge field A. Okay, so this gauge field would have to look like this. So uh, if you put gauge fields into lattices, uh, it's kind of like writing phases onto the hopping elements. And, and so instead of having the Hubbard model, you have the Hubbard model where hopping is associated with E to the I times some phase. That phase is related to this uh, A in this way. And so what we're doing by applying a, t a time dependent force, it's the same thing as putting on a time dependent phase onto tunneling. Okay. And, and, and now we're gonna look for the regime, which is linear response. We're gonna turn down that force until everything that happens is a linear response in, the f in this phase. Um, lots of other beautiful physics can occur if you crank up that force so that it's really strong and then you go to uh, uh, you go to kind of the rest frame of that shaking force, and, and I think we might hear a little bit more about that uh, tomorrow. No, no, maybe. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, there I was trying to make connections. <laughs> if not, you can forget all about this. No. Uh, so, okay, um, maybe uh, maybe another way of saying it is the following, which is. Um, and if I want to do this linear response kind of thing, uh, 
then remember that there was this block oscillation. The block oscillation frequency was this thing linearly proportional to the force. And so if I have a static force, I already have an oscillating response. Okay, that could be a problem. What, what I really want is um, I don't want to have the sign of a force and then a sign here. So I have a time dependent force inside the argument of a sinusoid. And it, it's only if I crank down the force, if I make this f really small, so that this can be, um, so that the frequency of drive is much higher than the block <laughs> oscillation frequency, or the force is much lower than the other way. And so now you can do uh, an expansion of this sinusoid and take only the first term, and, and now your response should be just at the frequency of the drive. So if we crank up the force too much, or we turn the frequency down too far, uh, then we're not going to see a response that's just linear in the drive. Okay. And we check that. So uh, checking that for us is we look at what happens when we shake. And so you shake at some kind of amplitude, and then you shake your trap for uh, higher and higher amplitude, and eventually you see uh, things roll over. So for instance, at this 60 hertz kind of shaking, things kind of roll over and saturate. So this was the linear response regime, and here we can throw our theory out the window. So we try to make sure we're staying in this linear response regime. Okay. So um, I'm going to skip that. This is how we do it. Uh, I've kind of alluded to this. We, we, we have cross dipole beams. We shake one of those cross dipole beams. And in shaking that, we displace the trap. And the relevant frequencies are, are something like tens of hertz. Okay. And now to look at the response, which I haven't talked about yet, we use a quantum gas microscope. So we cut away out of focus planes. We look at the middle couple of planes, usually four planes, and then we measure the center of mass of the cloud. So uh, when we do that kind of thing, we're you know, looking at our vacuum system, looking at the center of mass of the cloud, and, and we measure a response where data kind of looks like this. In, in one period of the drive, uh, the displacement, again in microns here versus time, has some kind of oscillation, but the center of mass of the cloud is not in the same place as the center of mass of the trap. It lags behind a little bit. So I, I pull like this, and the and the, the cloud will lag behind. Okay, and that's a phase lag in the oscillation. It also doesn't go as far because this cloud is sitting in an optical lattice, and I'm kind of dragging it through the lattice to see what how how willing it is to come along. So there's both an amplitude reduction or maybe enhancement if we hit a resonance and a phase lag. And we can fit those. So we know the frequency of the drive, and we fit that phase lag, and we fit the amplitude to a response, and that's our observable. So the observable is the center of mass dynamics. Okay. So if you do that, uh, then you get something like this. Whoops, sorry, I was too fast. You take this thing, okay, and, and now you can look at amplitude versus frequency, and indeed there is a little bit of a resonance, and the f you look at the phase lag, and it, and it does a little step around this resonance here. But don't look at the resonance too much. The point is that, that we have amplitude, and we have phase, and, and now we have the full information on this response. Okay? And the relationship of the response to current, to transport, is this, that current is the time derivative of the center of mass times the number of particles. Because if the whole cloud moved from one position to another, in order to get there, there had to be a current flowing to get everyone there. Okay, so if I have n particles which move one micron, then I know what all the currents were across that time. So now using that cosine and going into the complex plane, you have an expression for the current in this cloud, which is a function of that fit amplitude, the fit phase, the drive frequency, the number of atoms, all things we know <coughs> or measure directly. So this is conductivity. Um, we have a current. It came from a force. And the linear relationship between them is conductivity. This is Ohm's law, right? written out for atoms in a lattice. Uh, and, and so now we can look at the real part and the imaginary part of the conductivity. And the reason I put the real part in the main part of that figure is because that's the one which corresponds to dissipation. The real part of conductivity is dissipation, like having a one ohm resistor. It wasn't a one I ohm 
resistors, right? And, and, and so this is the stuff where you're asking about how does damping occur? How does non-reversibility occur? And uh, okay, so yeah. So now what I want to do is kind of go through a little bit of, of the discussion of, of how you think about currents and uh, how they relate to conductivity and an interesting property of currents in the Hubbard model. Okay. So, all right, a current uh, can be thought of in the following way. I've just told you that the current along some x direction is um, the, the change in the center of mass, let's say in the x direction, where uh, in, the, in the Hubbard model, I can write down this kind of center of mass operator as uh, the position of every lattice site times uh, the count of the number of atoms at that site. Okay. And remember, I'm thinking about a lattice. Okay, so um, if I'm looking at the third lattice site, then you know, A, L is equal to L times the lattice constant. So I'm just counting where things are, as giving them a position in X, and that's the uh, position operator. Now, if I want to take the time derivative of this operator, then I commute it with a Hamiltonian, right? So, so then I can use this Heisenberg relation, where I take the commutator with a Hamiltonian of this center of mass operator and find out what the current is. So the Hamiltonian I'm going to use is uh, the Hubbard model, and that is uh, some kind of tunneling between site J and uh, site K, like this. And um, so this is the tunneling between site J and site K. And I think I'm going to suppress all spin indices when I write this up here on the board. Uh, they're not going to do anything interesting. We're going to think about spin balance systems, and uh, it's just another index to write under everything. So uh, think spin, don't write spin. Uh, this is a spinful system. Although, actually, all the math I'm doing would apply for bosons, I think. No, I take that back. We're doing this for fermions. Okay, so um, the ideas carry over. The minus signs don't. So uh, the Hubbard model, of course, has another term, which is... Um, oh, there I lied. First thing after I... Okay, you'll see why that goes away quickly. So now, uh, and, and there could, by the way, also be some kind of trapping potential and other stuff here. But it's all going to go away really quickly in this kind of math. Because the first thing I'm going to do with this Hamiltonian is I'm going to commute it uh, with an operator that has a, an in in it, a measuring a the number of atoms at one position. Okay. And when I do that, it means that uh, uh, a lot of things don't matter. These things, they all commute uh, with a local operator, right? They commute with the center of mass operator. And so because of that, uh, I don't need to keep track of what's going to happen to this, this interaction. It's not going to affect the current. So I work out this commutator, what's going to happen? I need to now take a commutator uh, with this hopping element. Oh, and I, yeah, that's right. And um, I forgot a factor of n here. There we go. Yeah. Okay. And so when I do this, uh, then what do I get? I, I get that. Um, This thing looks like the sum over jk, uh, the sum over all the l's in that position operator, and then some kind of commutator of uh, the hopping and the position. OK, so now you're up against commutator math. Um, you can uh, use some nice identities, things like that the, the commutator of a position 
with a hopping is this. Sorry, I need a little more room. Etc. You know, these these kind of uh, identities to work this out. And what you get is that the current is then equal to it's equal to what? It's equal to So I need both the tunneling between the J and K site and uh, the difference in the location between the J and K site. And it makes sense that this together divided by H bar kind of gives you a current, right? Uh, the, this moves you between them. This is how far you go. This is how fast you go. That's a current. So this was actually for any even long range hopping. I haven't yet gone to nearest neighbor hopping only. So let me do that in the next step. And then when I do that, this just restricts you to only one lattice uh, in, in this uh, tight binding and this next uh, nearest neighbor approximation. And then this here will just be T, the nearest neighbor hopping. And so you get something that's even simpler. You get uh, the following. A current which is this and um, I'll write this in 1D, 1D. Everything's easier in 1D. Maybe Thierry Giamarchi wouldn't agree with that, but here it is. Okay. You get this in tight binding. Okay, for only nearest neighbor hopping and I'm just showing you one direction. So maybe, yeah, maybe this is the current in X. So this looks a lot like the original uh, Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, right? The, uh, the original hopping term was, except for this minus i out here and this silly constant, this is just hopping between l and l minus 1. And, uh, but now there's a minus sign. Okay, so it's not really proportional to the tunneling operator. It actually has a minus sign, and that's important. So. This is, by the way, uh, the total current. Okay. Let's now the local current is uh, just one element here. Okay. It's uh, some. Let's say at site L, this is going to be minus I, T, and uh, there's still this A L over H bar, but now I just Instead of taking the sum, you're just going between L and L plus 1, and, uh, and then plus the minus sign thing, Okay, plus the opposite sign. So this is a local current at site L, and this satisfies a continuity equation. As all currents, as all good currents should do, right? So the, the derivative of the, the density at uh, some site M. Uh, okay, let's call it L, sorry. Oops. Okay. Um, all these are operators. These are all operators. So these are derivatives of operators. These are not derivatives. This is just operator, like that. Okay, so this is the continuity equation written uh, for the local density on one side of an optical lattice, and these currents going, either the current going in or the current going out, 
has to carry away any change in density at that site. Okay, so this is like the one D divergence of current is equal to the time derivative of the local density. Okay, and um, okay, this gives you a good intuition, I hope, about what current is written in the Harvard model. It's only something you're going to write down when you want to do dynamics problems because these currents are all zero in equilibrium. In equilibrium, uh, the local density is not changing as a function of time. And so at least the divergence of this current should be zero. All right, so how do you make this kind of current? Um, I've just kind of told you about this. Uh, let's, let's think about applying an external force, okay? So we uh, apply this external force F, and I'm going to allow this to be a function of frequency. And, and then we just define the ratio of the response over this force as the conductivity, which is a, a frequency dependent quantity. But furthermore than that, it might be that you apply a force in one direction, and you don't necessarily get a response in that direction. Maybe there's a magnetic field around for these for charged particles or an artificial magnetic field for neutral particles then you can push along x and get a velocity along y okay so in general we have to define conductivity as a tensor which is some kind of uh, alpha beta these alphas and betas uh, might be one of the x y and z direction okay these are directions and so now this is the response along alpha for a force along beta, okay? And this is conductivity. So as I've just told you, uh, in, in our experiments and in any experiment where you're looking at the center of mass, you observe this center of mass operator. And then you find from the center of mass operator, you find what the current is, okay? find a current which is uh, the displacement of the center of mass over time and and so then you take a derivative of a cosine you get a sine and I can write that out uh, as the real part of some complex notation complex meaning in the complex plane not overly complicated hopefully uh, because exponentials are always easier to work with than sinusoids. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write uh, all of the action of what's happening in complex notation. But remember, in the end, we're going to take the real part as we go to an observable in the lab, and all observables uh, have to be real. OK, so it's in this sense that uh, I'm going to define this conductivity. So this conductivity is a complex number. Uh, it is uh, a tensor. Okay, and uh, what else? It's frequency dependent and it's extensive. I'm thinking about the total current applied uh, uh, rea resultant from a force. So knowing what this response is and knowing what the force is, then uh, you can find out that uh, the conductivity is written as I wrote already on the board. This kind of So what I want to do now is say, uh, I want to figure out what conductivity is. And I'm defining conductivity as uh, the response, this current, I get from a force. So what we'll do is now do the theory for applying a weak force and uh, seeing what kind of current comes out. Okay. So. What are we going to do? We're going to say that we have a Hamiltonian, which is equal to our original Hubbard model Hamiltonian. But then I'm going to add some kind of uh, perturbing Hamiltonian. And this perturbing Hamiltonian is a periodic force. Uh, what is it going to be? It's going to be um, 
cos omega t times a force. I'm going to turn it on slowly. Okay. And now uh, the energy that a force creates is, of course, uh, if I have a constant force, then I have a linear gradient in position. Okay. So a linear gradient in position is for each atom, the, f the potential is going to just be proportional to the location. So if there's an atom at position x, then it's sitting on that gradient of f. And uh, this is written out. So if I now find the force, I take the derivative minus the gradient of this, I get f. So this perturbing Hamiltonian and uh, these eigenstates. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, just to show you what that looks like again. Um, here. So the the force is is you know something like this. It's telling you about the displacement, and then the phase is displacement like that. That's why I'm not putting, maybe that was your question, that's why I'm not putting a plus phi in this cosine omega, because it defines what phi equals zero is. Yeah, good question. All right, so how do I solve something like this? Well, remember I said we want to be in the weak force limit, uh, the linear response limit, and so what kind of theory does that suggest? It says, oh, we need to do um, uh, time-dependent perturbation theory, right? And uh, what does that mean? just to remind you about that, it means we're going to take some kind of time-dependent wave function, we're going to write it as uh, the sum over a whole bunch of coefficients, we pull out of the coefficients the, the eigenenergies at h naught, and, uh, and then we call these uh, eigenstates uh, in. So what I mean is that the eigenstate in has an energy E in. And um, when you use this kind of formalism, as you know, probably, uh, uh, you write down a kind of Schrodinger equation and this interaction picture where I sum over uh, the matrix elements of the H1 from some uh, initial to final state, and then I have to keep around this, these energies. Now, um, what I'm going to do here is start everything in the ground state, just start everything in the, in the lowest state. That simplifies the math. You can extend this to uh, arbitrary states. So um, if, if we start in, uh, in, in the ground in this, then uh, it's, it's only this thing, which is 1 at first. And then we do the first order perturbation on that, uh, seeing how the other states fill up. And so this kind of sum becomes really easy because uh, this thing here is only has only one sum element, which is the uh, uh, gamma naught. Okay. So now what do we get? We get equations that when I plug in this matrix element, uh, look like this. We're going to have a matrix element um, between of this the center of mass operator between 0 and 1 uh, we have the the coefficients of this h1 and uh, and we have a whole bunch of exponentials here okay everything's written out so we've put everything in e to the i omega t type form Okay, and then there's a closed parenthesis here. So this is the time derivative of one of the coefficients of this 
And uh, what do we have to do? We integrate. Okay. And uh, here, I'm just going to start referring you to, to my notes. I just wanted to outline how this kind of calculation is done. And, and now what you need to know is, is I want to use these coefficients to figure out how much displacement occurs. So the question we're asking is, uh, what happens to the observable, to the expectation uh, value of the observed position? So the center of mass posi position in direction alpha. So here, um, I wrote down x, but, but really instead of x, what I should say is that uh, I have a force here, which is in some direction. So this is the force direction. And, and previously, we called that beta. So this was beta. And, and so this is now the force in direction beta, et cetera. This is the force in direction beta. And then this observable here becomes not xcm, but uh, wherever I'm applying the force. And the response is, uh, the response direction is in the alpha direction. So when we want to calculate this kind of um, observable, we're going to do this again in perturbation theory. So, uh, so the expectation value of in the alpha direction is going to be uh, the original wave function and then the amount that was transferred to other eigenstates. We sandwich in the center of mass operator of alpha, and then on the other side, again, the same wave function. So these coefficients are coefficients of time that depend on time. And so this is, again, this is the original state, the first order response, and then the other side, the original state and the first order response. And we're only going to keep around all the terms which are linear and forced. And we throw everything out that goes like force squared. And that's a, a huge simplification because we don't need to keep on doing this uh, uh, expansion. And for instance, the term which involves two of these gammas, um, we throw out as well because both of those gammas are going to be, if you look at it, uh, they're both going to be proportional to force. Right. And so when you put all this together, um, you get something that looks like this. You get that the connectivity in this first order perturbation theory is like this. You sum over all these states and we have two terms. One of them is um, this in the numerator and in the bottom this which I'll explain in a moment and the other one has the position operators just reversed like that and the f there's a minus sign in the bottom otherwise it looks the same And just to remind you, the uh, these NO, maybe I never said it actually, is the transition frequency between eigenstates. Okay. Uh, omega is still the drive frequency. And uh, these R alpha and beta are center of mass operators in two different directions. Um, and so what is this I uh, sigma plus? Uh, it, it ensures that because we turn things on slowly that everything stays causal. Uh, in other words, it, it means that uh, the, the poles for this are, are in the lower half of the complex plane. 
Uh, and so let me just say that the poles are in the right place <laughs> uh, for the, to avoid divergences. And this is some kind of analytic function in the upper half of the complex plane. OK. Um, I've, I've skipped a number of steps. I feel like too much time-dependent perturbation theory after 6 o'clock uh, in a hot room is not a great idea. So, so here's the notes on how to, how to do that. Um, I think the, the emphasis here is that the theoretical simplicity of doing linear response to make sure that in your experiment you're in that linear response zone is that now I can do perturbation theory and understand what I'm doing. And, and there's some nice uh, uh, clear properties that result. I can further simplify this kind of thing by looking at these denominators, by the way, and, and, uh, and taking the limit of this i0 going to 0. And what you find is that uh, the real part of this conductivity has uh, a nice form. This coefficient uh, stays around, and uh, and now you have um, r alpha between zero n, uh, r beta between uh, n and zero, and a delta function. And then you have another term which looks a lot like it, except with a plus sign. Uh, and now that's r beta 0 in r alpha in 0 at the opposite frequency. So what this tells you, this kind of thing, is that the real part of the conductivity, which is where you look for dissipation, is uh, happens when you drive and change, uh, you drive near the resonant frequencies to change between two eigenstates. So weak drive, you're affecting the system when you can move it from one state to another. Uh, another thing about the, the form of this is if you think about this as a function of frequency, when I take frequency and I switch to minus frequency, uh, then you have a, a relationship that this on the next page. The, uh, you have this kind of relationship where you take a complex conjugate and flip the indices when you go from um, minus the positive frequency. And that's that's a useful thing, because this is a complex thing. But if you have a complex thing with this property, then it can be the Fourier transform of a real thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, when you take, um, yeah, what do I mean by negative frequency? So. Um, wh yeah, so, so when, you, when you take a real time series and then you go to the complex plane, uh, then you also include negative frequency so that when you come back, uh, you can get uh, all the information back out again. So uh, let's see. What I mean by that is... Um, if uh, if I if I plot a time series in the complex plane, and uh, uh, you know I take take the real part of some function, and uh, it does this, and I take the imaginary part, and uh, um, Let's talk about this afterwards. I think I think I think it's starting to be a, a departure. Yes, yes. Unless someone has a much simpler way of explaining this. Um, just to assure you, in the lab, we never turn to negative frequency on the function generator. Yes, 
yes, I mean, essentially this is some uh, function which is defined for all frequencies, positive and negative, and that this mathematical construct uh, should have the right properties so that when you bring it back to things you care about, um, it has the right properties. Yeah. So th there's no difference. Yes, yes, yeah, good question. Okay, so um, when you have this kind of property, then um, this, this assures you that, that uh, this is the Fourier transform of some kind of uh, uh, real quantity. And, and in particular, uh, you can show that, that the conductivity, the Fourier transform of the conductivity is, uh, is, is the current current correlation function. So it means that if I launch a current at t equals zero, and then I ask what currents are doing later on, uh, this is like uh, 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 an impulse response, and and the Fourier transform of that is the conductivity. Okay. So. Uh, now that we have a nice expression like this for conductivity, we can integrate it. Um, and, and that's an interesting thing to do for the following reason. There's, for linear response, there are often things uh, that are called sum rules. Okay? And, and here, in particular, I want to think about a quantity which is 1 over pi times the integral over all frequency of the real part of the conductivity. Okay, and so uh, you can define this kind of sum rule for any direction. And the one that we're mostly going to be looking at here is the on diagonal, uh, when alpha and beta are the same thing. So what you can show using that uh, linear response form, that uh, this thing that you get when integrating the real conductivity is equal to the commutator, the double commutator that looks like this. Expectation value, OK? And so that. Uh, uh, notice, by the way, that, that this thing is kind of a familiar object. We just talked about this. Uh, this commutator here is the current, let's say, in the, in the beta direction. And, and so another way of writing this is just um, n over pi h bar times the expectation value of r alpha j beta. So it's a bit remarkable because this conductivity is a non-equilibrium response. You, you, you push on the thing, and you create some currents. Those currents don't exist in equilibrium. Uh, and now I do this at one frequency. I do it at another frequency, et cetera. I keep measuring this at different frequencies, and I see some kind of response. And now I average underneath all of that response, and I get something that comes back to equilibrium properties, because I'm taking this expectation value with the equilibrium state of the system. And so this relates the linear response non-equilibrium to the equilibrium property. And that's a very powerful connection. In some ways, what it means is that when I'm doing linear response transport and things like that, I'm not really measuring non-equilibrium physics. I'm not far from equilibrium. I can still find out uh, interesting things about this system with equilibrium properties. Okay, and, uh, and, and so let me take a, a few examples of this commutator, and you'll see that it's a, a pretty interesting thing. So, so the first example I want to take is, is just a free particle. Let's take the example of uh, some kind of Hamiltonian which has uh, n particles. with kinetic energy 
and it also has some potential which is only position dependent. And now I want to calculate these commutators and figure out if I measure current in this kind of system, what should the sum rule give us? Okay. So, uh, for instance, if I want to know what the x current is, then I need to take the commutator of this Hamiltonian with the center of mass position along x and uh, uh, then what does that give? Okay, this gives um, okay. The x, the center of mass in this system, by the way, is is just going to be uh, one over n times the sum of all the position operators. Okay, and now if you look at this. Um, I have something with position operators in it, and so once again it will commute with this term here. And, and this term, of course, can have a lot of complexity in it. That could be interactions between particles, that could be a trap, that could be a lot of different things that you describe with this general form. But the only thing that a position operator doesn't commute with is a thing that is more like this. Not something that's a function of position operators, but a function of momentum operators. So we only need to calculate this commutator, it commutes with the y and the z thing, so we only need to calculate the commutator of x with px squared. That's something you can do. And um, what you find is that this is just uh, the sum of px j over m. Uh, sure enough, a current is just the sum of velocities, right? Okay, that, that's maybe anticlimactic. A lot of formalism to tell you that a current is the sum of velocities. But, uh, but now, look what happens. I, I take this current operator and I put it back into the sum rule. I'm going to commute it again with another position. So I'm going to now commute this current here with this kind of thing again. And now I'm going to get you the result of the sum over real conductivity. So uh, it seems less trivial. So the sum rule is this uh, I h bar, and now I'm going to take the commutator of, uh, let's say, yeah, something in the, in the r direction, just to be specific, let's say uh, the, the y direction, and um, I commute that now with my current here, and, and what do you get? You get uh, um, if you plug all the right factors in, then you just get n over m times the Kronecker delta between the x and the y directions, or, uh, yeah, so this doesn't look very useful right now. What I mean is that y could be a, a direction in which you're uh, applying a force, and then x is a direction in which you're measuring the response, and so let's, you know, say this differently. This is um, n over m times uh, the Kronecker delta between alpha and beta, the drive direction and the response. So if I have a Hamiltonian that, that has this kind of thing, just p squareds in the kinetic energy operator, uh, then the, the sum, sum rule is diagonal. You don't expect any off-diagonal sum. So it's just equal to n over m. Okay. That's independent of temperature, that's independent of, uh, of interaction strength, interact independent of trapping potential, etc. Okay, so uh, here's another example, which is really relevant to uh, the case we're talking about here. Let's think about the Hubbard model, where um, uh, you've, we've already found that uh, the, the current, let's say, in the x direction has, uh, has this kind of form. this. Um, and now I can again calculate this sum rule. And let's just look at the on diagonal sum rule. It's going to be again n over i h bar uh, times the expectation value of rx jx. And uh, 
you plug in the math. Okay, you need to do some operator math again. And what do you get? What you find is that you get AL squared P over H bar times the sum of the expectation value of this. So uh, this is pretty simple because that is the tunneling operator. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't have an I in it anymore. So, so really this is just hopping from J to J plus 1, hopping from J plus 1 to J. Uh, and even you've got T in there, so I can pull in T. And now it's almost the first term of the Hubbard model, except for a factor of minus 2. In other words, this is equal to minus AL squared uh, over h bar times the expectation value of the x component of tunneling. Okay. So this is the kinetic energy in the x direction. It's telling you that the sum rule is connected to the kinetic energy in the Hubbard model. If you have some kind of isotropic system uh, with you know d dimensions, then the total uh, kinetic energy is just going to be d times uh, the kinetic energy in one direction. And so now I can write that the, the sum rule is equal to these constants times the kinetic energy divided by the dimensionality. Okay, so this says that uh, if I take the conductivity, I take the real part of the conductivity, I integrate over the response, then what I get is the kinetic energy in the system. Okay. By the way, uh, the units of this thing um, are, are 1 over mass. Okay. It should be because if I uh, look back at the, the other thing, this was also uh, units of, of, of 1 over mass. And what you can show is that uh, another way to write out this sum rule for the Hubbard model, I'm not going to derive this, but again, I'll post the notes, is you can show that more generally the sum rule is equal to the number of particles times the thermal average of the effective mass at all Q. Okay. And, um, and what I mean by that is, is you know that uh, the effective mass is uh, related to the, the second derivative of uh, the dispersion relation with some constants. If you now take a, a, a weighted average of that with a Fermi-Dirac distribution, then you get some kind of expectation value over the thermal distribution. That's this. So, so this, in fact, is a more general relationship. And uh, it tells you that... Um, um, how do I get a, uh, a kinetic energy from this? Well, one limit in which you, you might think about this is that if, since there is as many places in the band with positive as negative uh, effective mass, if I fill the band so that I have an equal weighting of, of particles at, at all Q, then I have as much positive as negative here, and then this becomes zero. So if, uh, if, if that becomes zero, another way of saying that is that the kinetic energy uh, is zero. You have a, um, a filled band has no kinetic energy, and then there can be no conductivity because the real part of the conductivity is positive definite. If its integral is zero, then it must be zero. So this kind of sum rule tells you how to take thermodynamics and, and turn it into an expectation for how much response you get. Questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So we turn on the drive slowly over, uh, in our case, something like 150 milliseconds. And we ramp it up slowly as well during that time. And then we 
let things equilibrate while the drive is continuing to go, and then we measure about 50 milliseconds later. So uh, how do we know how long to wait? Well, essentially, we try different drive strengths or different delays, and we measure the same thing, but not quite the same thing, because we also know if we're dissipating the external force, then we must be heating the system. So the disadvantage of measuring a dissipative process is that uh, we're heating while we're doing it. And, and so the longer we ramp it up, the slower we ramp it up, the more heating we have, the higher the temperature. Uh, and then we might not be looking at the initial state that we wanted to look at as some very low fragile temperature. So in, in practice, this may pause, cause problems, but we can talk. There, there are some ways around that. For instance, you can measure just the imaginary, imaginary conductivity, stay away from the places where you heat a lot, and then use Kramer's Kronig relations to go from imaginary to real conductivity. Um, yeah. Okay, so I've told you about uh, how we do this and the theory behind this, and now uh, what do we see? So why is there dissipation in the lattice? Let me come back to that question. Uh, if I have a collision in free space, collisions by themselves can't damp current. You know that because momentum is conserved and velocity is proportional to momentum. And if current is just the sum of all the velocities, then the sum of all the momenta is still conserved. And so J, the current, is conserved by collisions. Okay. So in free space, collisions are not enough to cause damping. But in a lattice, it's different. So even if quasi-momentum is conserved, um, uh, the current is not conserved because now the velocity is not just linearly proportional to the quasi momentum, it's uh, the sign of the quasi momentum. So this nonlinear relationship here means I can conserve this thing and not necessarily conserve uh, the sums of the signs of the individual quasi momentum. Worse than that, actually, quasi momentum is not necessarily conserved as we talked about, uh, was it this morning? I think so. And, uh, and so we'll come back to that. So um, here's another way of seeing why uh, collisions in a lattice should not necessarily conserve current. And that's because current is equal to the real mass momentum divided by uh, its, its mass. So if I had actually a particle in a lattice and I knew its momentum, I know how quickly it's moving. But Q doesn't tell me that, right? Q tells me quasi-momentum, and as we talked about yesterday, that means that in the same block state, there are particles moving around with all different kinds of momenta. And therefore, collisions which conserve this Q shouldn't necessarily conserve all those other uh, velocities, all those other momenta. Okay. okay, and so this is exactly what we see. So now let me show you some conductivity measurements. If I have the real conductivity here versus the drive frequency, if I have no lattice, you essentially see a delta function uh, in real conductivity. And, and so this thing has no width. And the width of the real conductivity tells you the relaxation rate. If we had turned on uh, this drive slower and slower, we would expect this thing to become more and more peaked and more delta function-like. And that's, that's according to a cone theorem. In fact, by the way, many of you have probably already done this measurement. How many of you measure your trap frequencies with parametric heating? Yeah, yeah, at least a quarter of you shake your trap uh, or, or squeeze it or do something to it uh, in, order to, in order to measure your trap frequency. But you're not that worried when you're doing that about the collisions between atoms. And that's because collisions don't shift around, uh, doesn't shift around the center of mass frequency and it doesn't change this, the resonance here. So this is a true measure of, uh, without the lattice, of uh, the trap frequency. But now as you turn on the lattice, you see what happens is the width here, which tells you about the damping rate, gets broader and broader, and, and therefore uh, dissipation is turning on. So, so the damping rate now is turning on as the lattice depth becomes more significant. So now when the lattice is around, collisions plus this breaking of, uh, of, of Galilean invariance allows this allows this scenario to be the one to think about where collisions now with this lattice uh, no longer conserve current. 
another thing that we talked about uh, this morning is that quasi-momentum during a collision may be strictly conserved, or it could be conserved only modulo 2 pi. So when we went through the math of what the Hubbard U does to collisions, then uh, you find that adding up all these exponentials, you can add or subtract another 2 pi from your quasi-momentum. Okay. And now we can do a calculation where we understand the damping rate in our system, and then we can by hand pull out these umclap events and just see how much of the damping is due to conserved quasi-momentum collisions and how much uh, with this kind of additional plus or minus 2 pi. And you find that actually these additional uh, umclap scatterings are really effective at damping current. Okay, so um, let me show you about how to think about that on a Brillouin zone picture. So this is the a, a collision here, this dot is an incoming quasi-momentum Q1 and an incoming quasi-momentum Q2. So the thing that's conserved, if total quasi-momentum is conserved, then you'd have to sit on a diagonal line here and choose Q3 and Q4 uh, on that line, right? So you add them up together and they must sit somewhere on the line uh, to have the same, you know, in any, anything on this line would be the same sum of, two of Q1 plus Q2. But now if I can, in, in addition to that, I can think about an event that has uh, 2 pi less, then I can also sit on this line here. Okay, So this would also be a set of allowed collisions once I have this umclap scattering. And, uh, and the way this is often described in condensed matter textbooks, if you, if you look for umclap in the index of some, some textbook you have, you'll find it as a kind of scattering to the next Brillouin zone. And, and there's this discussion of how far away other Brillouin zones are. And you do this by, by more or less realizing that I could have drawn this part of this line in the next zone over, oh, here, okay? And I could have drawn this part of this line in the next zone over here, okay? So, so now this is now the full line of allowed scattering events where I take the, the total quasi-momentum to be the same and I just extend it to the next Brillouin zone. Okay. Um, what else do we observe? Another thing we observe looking at this kind of damping rate, looking at the width of real conductivity, is that uh, we can take all our data, taken under different scenarios, look at these, these uh, real conductivity peaks. We change temperature or number or interaction strength, et cetera, and it, they all kind of fall on a, on a line which is proportional to u squared. Okay, we also need to scale everything by the density. The u squared dependence uh, should remind you of the discussion we had of the Hubbard u in block space. So if I write out the interaction term, it's scattering in block space, so it's kind of like you have a vertex of weight u, and, and that scattering now turns into a cross-section like that amplitude squared, so it goes like u squared cross-section. So that's why the damping rate due to collisions in the Hubbard model scales like u squared. And, and so we see that by looking at the widths of the real conductivity. Now what about the sum rule? The sum rule is uh, taking this, the data we have and integrating underneath the peak. So if we have real conductivity versus dry frequency, we integrate under the data. And again, we can take these kind of responses under different scenarios, different temperatures, numbers, interaction strength, lattice depth, and all the data falls on this, you can see all the data falls very nicely um, on a theory which is just this uh, thermally averaged one over effective mass, okay? Something like the kinetic energy in this case because nearest neighbor tunneling does pretty well. And, and so that explains everything. So basically, no matter what the conditions are, the only thing that matters is the temperature and therefore the thermodynamics of the system when we're measuring the F sum. Uh, on the other hand, kind of remarkable is that as we change the interaction strength, which I just told you uh, is very important to the width of this curve, uh, so the more interaction strength, the, the broader this curve, the integral under the curve doesn't change. So here is this F sum, and now we change U over T uh, up to about a factor of 5, so U squared goes up by 25, but you see the F sum doesn't change very much at all. And so the rule is that 
that you can find in uh, in Mahan and other kind of condensed matter books talking about conductivity is that collisions don't destroy conductivity they just move it from one frequency response to another so these collisions uh, broaden or displace uh, response but they don't reduce the total response the total response the integral under uh, the dissipation is a thermodynamic property yeah yes yes exactly Ah, okay, this was only a theory uh, thing. So, so we cannot, um, in the observation, we cannot take out the umclaut scatter events. Those do not tag themselves. That's right, that's right. So uh, unless we counted, yeah. So, so I'm not telling you that we could run uh, a, a control experiment where we remove this process. It, it's, uh, in fact, as we found when we derived this, these come out of the same scattering math that give you the conserved quasi-momentum. So they're always there. Yes. What did we find the ratio was? So the, the uh, there is actually no difference in the weighting between them. They happen with equal likelihood. So all allowed final events happen with equal likelihood once you're in the tight binding limit. It's simply that the ones which um, strictly conserve quasi-momentum for a large part of the band structure actually do pretty much conserve current. So for instance, um, at the bottom of a, of a cosine band, then it does look parabolic. And so if atoms sitting there are scattering, then uh, they, uh, they look like velocity is conserved for them. Because for in any parabolic dispersion relationship, then velocity is actually proportional to quasi-momentum. Um, just to remind you what those look like. If you're sitting in this part of the band structure, then uh, velocity is linear in quasi-momentum. So if I conserve quasi-momentum and I'm uh, here, which is at the thermodynamically more likely because it's at lower energy, then collisions actually do conserve current. That's when you know sine of Q looks like Q. So umclap scattering take those same of same initial Qs and they throw them, they kind of scatter them to the wind because I can now add uh, another pi and and go from here to there because I can take that two pi distributed among my final particles. So if I have a collision that's you know sitting around here, I can end up over here and over there. So so it allows you to uh, leave a place where in the in the band structure where conserved quasi momentum conserves current and kind of kicks you into a place where a lot of dissipation of current has occurred. Yeah. So it's not that they happen more likely. It's just that they're more effective at damping. Good question. Yeah. Well, it depends on how you count. I mean, remember that that um, that this is a Brillouin zone is uh, a set of unique events, and and now I can either write this this event here or I can write it there. As long as I don't include both of them, uh, then I'm not double counting. I'm not saying this goes to higher bands. It does not go to higher bands. It stays within the same Brillouin zone, and and maybe this is confusing to you. Uh, it, this is tells the full story that uh, events that start here can end up over there. Another way of thinking about it is that uh, the de Broglie waves. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this is enough. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Other questions. Yes. 
I guess if I could argue to you that uh, it's more likely to be backscattering than forward scattering, that extra bump of, of, of K, then, then I think you would agree that it's more like damping. Uh, but I'd not immediately obvious to me. It's a good question. So that's what I wanted to tell you today. Um, what I've told you about is that uh, if you have a perfect crystal and you want to know how it acquires resistance, there are two necessary ingredients. One of them is that you need to break Galilean invariance with that crystal, and the other is that there are atom-atom collisions. And then even without defects and impurities and phonons, you still get finite resistivity in perfect lattices. Uh, we've talked a little bit about umclap scatterings, which, which are the kinds of events which are really great at, at uh, damping current. And I've shown you this kind of remarkable frequency sum rule, which connects the dynamics to thermodynamics. So things we can calculate with expectation values of uh, an equilibrium. And, and we find that the sum rule of the sum over all this conductivity is independent of, of the trap and independent of inter interactions. So we can now take this kind of thing and, and go to more interesting regions in phase space, maybe across a phase transition. Maybe you can add magnetic fields and see off-diagonal properties, uh, go to stronger interactions and see, see what happens, etc. cetera. Um, this part of my talk was strongly based on data and collaboration and discussion with uh, my students, Reese, Vijin, Pei Hung, my postdoc, Fudong, who's now uh, gone to SUSTEC, and uh, Frederick Chevy, who's in the audience. And so uh, I owe them what I know and what I can show you. And so this is the last lecture. I to told you about these things. Thanks for your attention and your questions. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. So that would be an experiment in pursuit of smaller signal. And, and so we're limited by signal to noise uh, that we can't go to an insulator right now. So there's no reason in principle we can't do that. Uh, it's simply that uh, we're already looking at displacements of the entire cloud on the order of one lattice site in order to stay in the linear response regime. And so going to a regime where the whole cloud has a displacement of much less than one lattice site becomes challenging. So um, it, it's simply a question of signal to noise. So what we need to do is either do a better job or uh, think of a, a different way of measuring displacement or a different way of measuring current. The same paradigm uh, uh, should in principle be able to be extended there. There's another feature that you could look for, which is that if you go to a mod insulator, then you should have a band gap. I mean, sorry, you should have a mod gap and then another peak in response at, uh, uh, at you where you break or uh, make pairs, you make pairs. And uh, that's actually not that dissimilar to uh, what has already been done as uh, by, by shaking and, uh, and actually modulating an amplitude, not shaking, and seeing that you break and make pairs in the mod insulating regime. Well, uh, it, it, there are two effective masses in this problem. One of them is the effective mass at the bottom of the band. Okay. And then the other is the effective mass, which is thermally averaged over th throughout the entire band. So for instance, if I go to high temperature, the effective mass at the bottom of the band doesn't change. 
but the thermally averaged uh, effective mass can go to zero. Or actually, the mass goes to infinity. One over the mass goes to zero. And, and so uh, what's changing as we uh, change here, as we, as we change temperature, this here is something like uh, one over the thermal averaged effective mass. Okay? And, and so what's changing here is this function of temperature. It is surprisingly independent of interaction strength. So we, in neither of these quantities have we seen a very clear change in effective mass due to interactions. On the other hand, let me just say that this scale here, for instance, goes out to u over t of uh, 25, which is u over t of 5. So we're not in the modern insulating regime or anywhere close, where uh, there u is a, is a multiple of the bandwidth. Here is 12t, right? So uh, we would need to be at much stronger interactions before we really modify the thermodynamics with the interactions. Here we're measuring dynamics and seeing that that has an effect, uh, that u has an effect on the dynamics, right? So, so the, this damping rate is changing as a function of u, but uh, uh, we haven't gone to a different phase. It's still metallic, and uh, and and that metal is is fairly robust to interactions on the scale of Cronlund. different from what we expect? Not yet. No, we can do this analysis locally. Um, we can talk about this, but uh, essentially what you can do if you want to extend this to a local measurement is now you don't have a center of mass anymore. And the problem is if I have a, have a uniform density and I create a current, but there's no divergence in that current, I don't see a, a signature of it in density anymore, right? If I have as much flowing in and out into a certain volume, uh, it's no longer the case I can take an image of that and see currents. It's only when I have a lump of something and the lump moves left that I say, oh, there must have been currents, right? So how do I then take an image in, in a microscope and see currents? And, and one way you can do this is uh, if you have just uh, some profile and you see things move around, it still with a non-uniform density, locally you can see some kind of modulation in density and then you know that that is equal to the divergence of the current and now you can integrate divergences of current out to the edges of the trap where you know that there's no current. And so you can kind of like step by step reconstruct currents everywhere. This only works either in 1D or in 2D when there's no curl. If there's a curl, then uh, uh, I, can't, I can't get the full information that way either. So you have to be careful when you go to local density. It's, it's possible to reconstruct currents, but there's some conditions under which that signal has meaning. Other questions? We're one minute after time. Thank you.